Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In 2000, then President Kim Dae jung became the first Korean to receive a Nobel Prize for his life's work dedicated to democracy and, to quote the Nobel Committee, peace and reconciliation with North Korea in particular. The award was granted shortly after the first North-South Korean summit in June of the same year, and in recognition of the merits of the Sunshine Policy in general. Yet, 15 years later, Kim Dae-jung's legacy remains controversial. Not only is the success of the policy debatable, but some have also criticized the cost he was willing to pay in the name of reconciliation. An outspoken critic of Kim Dae-jung's approach to North Korea is journalist and author Donald Kirk who published in 2010 a biography of the late president with a focus on his political career and the Sunshine Policy, entitled Korea Betrayed, Kim Dae-jung and Sunshine. In this episode, we spoke with him about Kim's priorities when dealing with North Korea, as well as his lifelong quest for the Nobel Peace Prize. Donald Kirk is a veteran journalist and correspondent in the Asia-Pacific. He has reported for many of the conflicts and hotspots in the region since 1965 and covered the Vietnam, Gulf, and Iraq wars. He has also extensively reported on Korean affairs, including the assassination of President Park Chung-hee in 1979, the Guangzhou uprising in 1980, the nuclear crisis of 1994, and the 2000 Inter-Korean Summit. Donald Kirk is a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Chicago. He has received numerous awards, including the Overseas Press Club of America Award, the George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting, and the Chicago Tribune's Edward Scott Beck Award. He was also a Ford Fellow at Columbia University, a Fulbright Scholar in India during the 60s and in the Philippines during the 90s, and the recipient of National Endowment for the Humanities Grant at MIT, among others. Donald Kirk, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. It's glad to, I'm glad to have the chance to meet you. So you have been reporting from Korea on and off for decades. Why did you come to Korea in the first place? I first came to Korea as Far East correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. I was based in Tokyo with the Tribune and went to Vietnam a lot for them and other places. And they also sent me to Korea. So that's how I got involved in Korea. I, my first experience in Korea was during the Red Cross talks uh, in the spring of 1972. The Red Cross talks were talks between North and South Korean Red Cross representatives. The idea was that they would try to solve all the problems that we're still talking about now, notably family reunions and exchange of mail and trade and aid and all those problems that we hear about now, they were talking about then. They still haven't solved it. That was 1972. You have decided to focus recently uh, on President Kim Dae-jong. Why are you interested in this man? I, I got interested in him because I was covering Korea during his pre before and during his presidency. I was very much interested in the sunshine policy, family visits, uh, and so forth. I wrote a lot about the first uh, inter-Korean uh, summit in June of uh, 2000. They had a huge press room at the Latte Hotel where they talked about what was going on in Pyongyang. We had video from Pyongyang. We had uh, images from Pyongyang. Uh, we had press releases from Pyongyang summarizing what was going on during the summit. Uh, so I got very much interested in Kim Dae-jung at that time. And by the way, I should also add that during my first visit to Korea in 1972, I interviewed Kim Dae-jung. So I interviewed him several times over the years. I probably interviewed Kim Dae-jung at least half a dozen times. First time in 1972 when he was a dissident uh, living in his uh, compound in Mapo. Before going any further, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about Kim Dae-jung, the man, before he became the president? So you met him in Mapogu for the first time. Right. He's originally from an island uh, down there in the southeastern corner of South Korea, in, in the Cholo region, South Cholo province. But I interviewed him in his compound in Mapo. And uh, he was then uh, very much a dissident and uh, was quite outspoken. I interviewed him before he was kidnapped, before he went to Japan where he was kidnapped. And then I interviewed him after he got back from Japan, after he'd been kidnapped, when he told me 
the story of his kidnapping and that kind of thing. I interviewed him during the Guangzhou revolt at home, at his home then. He was finally arrested, you know, uh, and jailed for what they claimed was his role in fomenting the Guangzhou revolt. But I, I interviewed him at his home before his arrest. There was a period there when actually it looked as if Korea would be fairly democratic. That was after the assassination of Park Chung-hee in October 1979. An interim president, a person who had been prime minister, became president. His name was Mr. Che. He became president, and he, he was not effective. Chun Duan seized power from him. Kwangju revolt broke out in May of uh, 1980. So I interviewed DJ. Kim, we always called him DJ, and I call him DJ in the book, incidentally, because you can't keep on calling him Kim when there's so many Kims around. So he was, he was a very uh, interesting person to interview as a dissident. And I and a lot of other correspondents were extremely impressed by him. How did your perception of him change over time? How did that evolve? After the uh, June uh, 2000 summit, I think I got rather disillusioned by his uh, cozying up to North Korea, by what appeared to me to be concessions he was making to North Korea. One of the first concessions he made in arranging the June 2000 summit, he freed a lot of uh, North Koreans who were held here in jail, 60 plus, who were here who'd been arrested for various offenses, mostly spying and that kind of thing. He freed them and let them go back to North Korea where they claimed they wanted to go. He never demanded before or during or after the summit that North Korea free more than 500 South Koreans who were held there, the vast majority of them fishermen who intruded into North Korean waters uh, mostly by accident and just simply were, have never been released. He did not demand their release. He, he seemed to place a higher priority on reconciliation and on sunshine. Uh, meanwhile, North Korea continued as an extremely dictatorial state, and I didn't hear DJ complaining about that. I asked him once, uh, I did interview him one time, one final time, when he was president in the Blue House, uh, and I asked him why he didn't raise this issue with North Korea. He said, well, first they wanted to reconcile North Korea so they'd be in a better position to get along with North Korea and to bring North Korea to some kind of humane, he didn't use this word, by the way, to bring North Korea to some kind of humane terms. You know, it occurred to me at the time, and I've thought it ever since, oh, that's fine, sure, but what does that do for the tens of thousands of people held in prison in North Korea? Do they want to wait? Uh, how can they wait for North Korea to re for reconciliation? Uh, they need somebody in a very powerful position calling for their release and calling for humanitarian policy. DJ never did that. He never did that. Instead, he blamed the U.S. for messing up the sunshine policy, for ruining his sunshine policy. Although uh, President Bush uh, was actually uh, quite conciliatory in the end, after President Bush was inaugurated, George W. Bush, the second President Bush, after he was inaugurated, uh, DJ rushed to Washington, more or less rushed, to see him at the White House. It was then that President Bush gave DJ kind of a cold shoulder. He said, well, you know, he really was skeptical, is the word he used, about uh, Kim Jong-il. And he, was, he indicated doubts about North Korea, which was sort of a rejection of DJ's policies and so forth. So there was a great effort after that, that meeting between DJ and President Bush, and shortly after President Bush's inauguration, was more or less a disaster. There was a great effort after that to get along. I was here uh, when President Bush came here, and he and DJ stood side by side at a press conference in the Blue House, and were very friendly and palsy wowsy and all that. Then DJ went up to Dora Station, which is the new station, the last station on the line to North Korea. And uh, again, uh, they issued very nice statements and so forth. If you go up to Dora Station, you'll even see inscribed uh, George W. Bush's words uh, on a tablet there. So it seems as if they're getting along well. But when I met uh, DJ, uh, uh, he was always very critical of Bush, especially after DJ was no longer president. I met DJ uh, in his home in Mapo again sometime after the end of his presidency. He was very upset about U.S. policies, about the turn of U.S. policy, and he blamed President Bush for everything. Professor Moon Jong-in, whom we interviewed recently, actually said that it is a bit unfair to criticize the Sunshine Policy for failing, since it never had the chance to actually take place properly. It only lasted a few months before exogenous problems, such as the United States and North Korean tensions, 
put an early end to it. Would you agree? Not quite. First of all, I wouldn't say it only lasted a few months. It lasted during DJ's presidency and into the presidency of DJ's successor, Nomu Hyun, who essentially had the same policy. So it lasted quite a while. And a key element in this policy was that South Korea every year shipped a total of, was it 10 million tons of rice and fertilizer or wheat, rice and fertilizer to North Korea, free of charge, basically free of charge. There may have been some long-term interest which I can't remember, and which is not really a major element in the deal anyway. But South Korea was shipping all this aid to North Korea. Uh, as soon as Lee myung bak became president, he cut it all off. He succeeded no Hyun. He stopped that. But uh, that was one reason why the Sunshine Policy endured, because North Korea was getting these tremendous shipments from South Korea. North Korea had a lot to be thankful for. At the same time, DJ wouldn't take any chances on... Uh, messing up the sunshine policy no matter what happened. There was a shootout in the West Sea to, in uh, 1999 and another shootout in 2002 in which uh, a number of sailors were killed on both sides. Uh, more North Koreans were killed in the first one. All had to do with North Korean intrusions over what's called the Northern Limit Line, the line below which uh, North Korean vessels, mostly notably fishing vessels, are banned. So there were these incidents, and DJ really didn't make strong statements. He simply wanted to cover them up. There was also a tremendous incident when a North Korean mini-submarine landed on the East Coast, and half a dozen of these guys all committed suicide inside the submarine. And again, this was an incident. It was a headline-grabbing incident, but DJ didn't want to make too much of a fuss about it. As we all also know... During the incident involving the two 13-year-old schoolgirls who were run over by a 48-ton uh, U.S. armored vehicle north of Seoul, north of Weijongbu, they had demonstrations on, on the street out here going on for months. I was at many of those demonstrations. I was at the trial of the uh, two uh, U.S. sergeants who were eventually acquitted by a military court. The court said that these guys couldn't see the girls. They were had their backs to, to the vehicles. They were had uh, gizmos in their ear. They were listening to music, they, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they eventually acquitted these guys. Then the demonstrations got even more serious. They got so serious that actually they're blamed for the defeat of the conservative Lee Wei Chong in his campaign for president and uh, the victory of No Mu Yun because the conservatives looked really bad. So DJ, when visiting U.S. senators, called upon him and said, uh, what can you do about this? He tried to blame the United States, you know, in, in effect. He basically said, you know, why can't you do something about your, your, your soldiers and that sort of thing? And why can't you uh, do something about uh, discipline for the troops, uh, etc.? cetera? Uh, so DJ really blamed, in effect, not loudly, he didn't make a speech, but he indicated, he implied that, well, maybe the U.S. should reconsider what it was doing. Maybe they're at fault. Uh, my people are very angry, et cetera, et cetera. He played a very political role, which was uh, which did not ingratiate him to me uh, or to quite a few others. Uh, so I, I frankly think D.J. was a serious opportunist. Also, D.J. Over, over the years claimed that he was... There were several attempts to assassinate him, uh, the first being a motor vehicle accident in Chola when he, during a political campaign in which he was rushing back to Seoul in a vehicle. Uh, he claimed that, that President Park Chung-hee, president at the time, tried to kill him. Uh, this claim is basically nonsense. The car, from everything that we've heard, was speeding, uh, as cars tend to do. Uh, they had Kim Dae-jung in the car, and he had to get to Seoul, and his driver you know, was going full tilt. A couple of taxi drivers were killed in the accident, his car rammed into the back of a truck. It was not uh, an assassination attempt. We can forget about that. Uh, when he was, After he was kidnapped from the hotel room in Tokyo, and nobody can deny that he was kidnapped. That was one of the incredible incidents. After he was kidnapped, he was placed on a boat to be taken back to South Korea. I certainly could not blame him if he was terrified and so forth. He claimed, he claimed, credited the U.S. with sending a plane over that boat, and that this was why he wasn't thrown overboard. No, no, there was no American plane. Uh, what he heard was the sound of the engines of the boat. If you, there was no sound of a plane. The Americans did not attempt to uh, rescue DJ. They didn't know where he was, and they weren't in a position to send a plane buzzing the boat. So there was no plane. On the other hand, uh, the American ambassador at the time, Philip Habib, made a strong protest directly to Park Chung-hee. Uh, Donald Gregg uh, 
who later became ambassador here, was head of the CIA here. And he uh, made a strong case that DJ had to survive this uh, kidnap attempt. So uh, there was all kinds of American support. There just was no plane. That was all. That was just a story that DJ concocted, uh, giving him the benefit of the doubt he may have been fooled by the engine. So in your book, you mentioned that despite being quite critical of various parties, Kim actually had little to say about human rights, about mismanagements of the North economy, about the 1.1 million North Koreans under arms. And that's a quote from your book. Was the silence on those issues a precondition to discuss and have relations with North Korea? Or was it just that he generally did not care about those issues? Well, I think that he may not have cared as much as he should have about those issues, but I think he was sure that if he made a fuss about that, then, he, then there could be no sunshine policy of reconciliation. DJ, a couple of factors about DJ's background. He was from South Chala province. He never was in the Korean War. He never experienced the tragedy of the war. And he, he didn't have the, the feeling of empathy uh, with millions of South Koreans to whom the North Koreans were a daily threat at, at, during the war and who looked back with horror and, and, and sadness on the tragedy that occurred. So he didn't have that feeling about North Korea. At the same time, he, he didn't want to jeopardize sunshine policy. He had a great idea that perhaps there could be reconciliation in the form of a confederation of North and South Korea. North Korea could have its system, South Korea could have its system, and there could be a confederation. This was basically a cockamamie theme, a cockamamie idea. Anybody who knows North Korea knows that there cannot be confederation between North and South Korea, under which they would really be equal. What would you do with the armed forces? What would you do with travel back and forth? What would you do with commerce? What would you do with letters, normal communications, visits, etc.? Uh, that was really a ridiculous idea. One theme of DJ, which was particularly uh, disquieting, was his quest for the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize. For years, before he had this inter-Korean summit, he was campaigning for the Nobel. And uh, after the summit, he revved up the campaign. He, he pulled out all the stops. Korean embassies were deputized to work for the Nobel. Uh, the, the embassies in Norway and Oslo and in Sweden uh, gave receptions, made contacts with Nobel people, had dinners, lunches, anything they could do to push DJ for the Nobel. They tried to be fairly subtle and careful about it. They just exchanged information. Here's some background information on their leader. And, you, you know, there, were, there was nothing that he would leave to chance. Uh, I, I'm told that he even approached uh, the Quakers, the Friends, uh, American Friends Service Committee in Tokyo, otherwise in the, in the vernacular they're known as Quakers, for their support. But there was nobody or no stone left unturned to get him the Nobel. Uh, you know, the National Intelligence Service, the top levels of the NIS, then called the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, the top levels of the KCIA had to forget about a lot of their mission of finding out what was really going on in North Korea. They had to do whatever they could to get the Nobel for DJ. I actually wrote a book, uh, co-authored it with a former NIS agent uh, called uh, Kim Dae-jung and the Quest for the Nobel. And this book, uh, I must say, was about to be published. It was accepted, edited, about to go to press. And then the publisher got cold feet and halted publication, I think under pressure from some of DJ's people. So to understand this quest for the Nobel Prize, a moment you describe as important is when he actually went uh, to the United States in exile in the 80s. Could you tell us more about that? Well, while he was in exile in the 80s, he was treated as a hero, of course. He had a fellowship at Harvard uh, arranged by Reischauer, Edwin Reischauer, who had been U.S. ambassador to, to Japan and uh, was a, just retired as a professor at Harvard. Uh, he had a great fellowship at Harvard. He didn't spend a lot of time in Cambridge, actually. He was based in northern Virginia, where he did a lot of, continued to campaign for the Nobel. I interviewed him during that period in Springfield, Virginia, where he was living. I, I didn't find him at Harvard, although he was supposedly at Harvard. He did come out uh, during that time at Harvard with a, a great uh, long uh, paper, maybe even a, might even have been a short book, about the Korean economy. Uh, which had, to be honest with you, it was basically nuts. 
uh, you know, it was basically nonsense. Although he mentioned having written it in subsequent years, he didn't uh, brag about it. He didn't start going back to what it was saying. He was totally critical of Park Chung Hee, totally critical of the Chebel and so forth. Now, I have everybody uh, to whom I know has quite mixed feelings about Park. People do say that he was a dictator and he, and he was, there were many bad things done during his 18 and a half years as president. But he also uh, is held in high regard for his economic policies, for getting the table off the ground and, and up and running, competing on an international scale. DJ has nothing good to say about Pac's economic policies. He totally critical of how, how the table are operated. What did the Nobel Prize mean to him? Why did he want it so bad? He wanted it as just the pinnacle of his career, the crowning moment of his career, his coronation, as it were. He went to Oslo, gave a Nobel Prize speech, uh, and he was venerated uh, as this great statesman uh, on the same level as, say, Nelson Mandela. Uh, many people to this day regard him on the same level as Nelson Mandela and uh, Walesa, Poland, and so forth. Others uh, who uh, were tremendous peacemakers and who had this, these great reputation as heroic leaders. And to, to some degree, DJ's reputation was deserved. I don't want to be totally critical, but he was absolutely crazy about getting the Nobel Peace Prize. It was just the ultimate accolade. Uh, no other Korean has ever won any kind of a Nobel Prize. This was a great moment in DJ's uh, life. And it, in his view, for modern Korea, although I'm not sure a lot of Koreans care all that much. While he was in uh, Oslo talking and being uh, interviewed and photographed and, and so forth, while he was there, there was a lot of criticism in the Korean media about his trip, you know, because he went there while they were suffering from economic problems and usual problems. Uh, so the, the Korean media, particularly the conservative media, which never liked him, had quite a few unfavorable comments to make about him. He campaigned for quite a while and he actually was rejected for the Nobel Prize a few times. How did he take those defeats? I think he took the defeats, by the way, I think it was more than a few times. I think it was 13 times. Uh, there was somebody uh, who said that he was asked to write a letter on DJ's behalf 13 times. The number 13 is the number that comes to mind. He, he viewed a defeat, uh, from all I can see, as simply a reason to keep going and try harder the next time. He never accepted defeat in his quest for the Nobel. He simply ordered his... Uh, AIDS, and when he was president, ordered the KCIA to go after the Nobel uh, more intensely than ever. It was just a just the crowning moment of his lifetime. So would you say that the Sunshine Policy and his political agenda overall was focused on, well, obtaining that Nobel Prize? A lot of the Sunshine Policy was focused on obtaining that Nobel Prize. Now, one other thing, and it's very important to mention of course, he wanted to arrange his visit with Kim Jong-il, the first inter-Korean summit. Uh, there was a tremendous payoff involved. At least $500 million was sent to North Korea uh, through Hyundai Asan, the Hyundai company that had dealings with North Korea, the company that was responsible for the Kaesong Industrial Complex and for the Mount Kumgang Tourist Zone. Uh, Hyundai Asan uh, got the money into North Korea. At least $500 million, and some people think it was much more, much, much more. There was ultimately an investigation involved. And finally, the chairman of Hyundai Asan, Chung Mong Hun, one of the sons of the founder of the Hyundai Empire, Chung Ju Young, committed suicide. He jumped from his office in the Hyundai headquarters, what was then the Hyundai headquarters, uh, not far from here in central Seoul. There was the usual speculation was he pushed, was he murdered, or did he really commit suicide? I tend to think he committed suicide. I visited the site of the suicide the next day. I saw these bushes where he'd landed, which were crushed. And then I went to the funeral uh, and presented condolences along with thousands of others uh, uh, to his brothers who were standing in line in front of the casket wearing the hemp hats. They wear these severe looking hemp hats uh, in mourning. And I bowed before them and so forth. I, I placed a white chrysanthemum on the altar, as did everybody else who... Who, who walked by. Just because I went, had this experience and this memory does not mean that Chung Mong Hun was not murdered. But my, my feeling, you know, which could be wrong, is that he committed suicide uh, as this investigation got closer to him, as, as his whole role in transferring the money was revealed. Very embarrassing.
Professor Chong In Moon, whom we mentioned previously, mm. actually, when asked a similar question, said that sending money to North Korea was a presidential decision. There was nothing wrong about it, just in order to get concessions. And that in the case of the Hyundai sending money as well, it might just be because there is simply no legal way of sending money from South Korea to the entity that is not recognized as existing in North Korea. Well, Professor Moon uh, may think there's nothing wrong about it. Other people would disagree. It seems like a, quite a large payoff just for a summit. I'm not saying that uh, it wasn't justified in the interest of inter-Korean reconciliation, but it wasn't publicized. It became revealed later. There was a huge investigation. A lot of people thought there was a lot wrong with it. Uh, the summit was basically bought at a quite a high price. And as I said, some people think the price was considerably higher than $500 million. So I would say that, uh, I would say that there was a lot wrong with, ha with having to send $500 million to North Korea. Where did the Sunshine Policy actually come from? I mean, of course, you might have an interest in it, but why such an engagement with North Korea? How did that come about? I think there's always been a yearning uh, for some kind of reconciliation with North Korea. How do you do it? DJ's predecessors, uh, Park Jung-hee and then Kim Jong-sam, had such terrible relations with North Korea. And, and I think that many people thought, well, there's got to be a way to reconcile with North Korea. And so they attempted, he came up with this great scheme, which was quite captivating in a way. It just didn't really work because it was based on a huge payoff to North Korea. It didn't recognize North Korea's criminal problems. Uh, it didn't recognize the human rights issue. It didn't recognize the need for North Korea to scale down its uh, program, nuclear program, missile program to reduce the size of its armed forces. So basically, the Sunshine Policy didn't work. But it came about from the desire of many Koreans, not just people from the southeastern, southwestern Chola provinces, but many Koreans, to somehow see why can't we get along with these people. As you seem to say, it's tried to offer the dream to the Korean people. But why was it so successful that he actually was able to get the Nobel Prize? Was it just because of good campaigning? Or did it actually play on some type of emotion uh, internationally as well. I think it definitely played on an emotion in, internationally. Of course, he won the Nobel Prize after the June 2000 summit. That had a lot to do with his winning, finally winning the Nobel Peace Prize, although he'd been trying to get it for years. So, so I, I do think that it had a lot to do with sort of this wave of emotion internationally. I think that the Nobel Prize people in Oslo are quite, uh, shall we say, liberal in their outlook, uh, can be taken in by people like Kim Dae-jung. Uh, and uh, I think that was a problem, too. And also, in South Korea, there was a, a wave of feeling of, of amazement that maybe we're really going to reconcile with North Korea. This got very soon disillusionment set in, disappointment, disillusionment. But there was a feeling that maybe the South really could recon reconcile with the North. You mentioned the 2000 summit uh, numerous times. Did it lead to anything? Was it just a very nice show? Or 15 years later, can we say that it actually had an impact on North-South relations? Well, it did have a certain impact. For one thing, uh, one of the agreements in the summit was for family visits, for reunions of uh, families that have been divided by the Korean War. There have been a number of those reunions. Of course, North Korea stops them whenever they get angry or whenever there's some, some terrible problem between North and South Korea. There's supposed to be a reunion later this month. That's an outgrowth of the uh, June 2000 summit. I, that seems to me to be the most substantial uh, result of the summit. But that's very limited. The number of people who've actually been united in reunions is less than 20,000. There's hundreds of thousands of families that are divided. They say 10 million families were divided. Hundreds of thousands of people are still left who would like to see their old long-lost relatives again. You mentioned that in your book you write that Kim's legacy has been to hold up an illusion of harmony and unity. Why do you hold such a crushing verdict on it? Like what elements specifically will you point out to say that in the end there was nothing really happening? The major point is that in the end uh, there really was nothing. Uh, in the end North Korea remains as hostile as ever toward the South. Not only are they not getting a massive infusion of funds, but they're not getting the aid uh, that they were getting during the t decade of the Sunshine Policy under uh, Kim Dae-jung and No Mu Yun, and they're not getting the uh, benefits uh, that that they expected uh, 
during that decade of sunshine. And so since they're not getting it, they've been rather harsh in their judgments of, of Noah Young's successors. The sunshine policy basically broke down in 2002. That was when North Korea was revealed to uh, have been uh, conducting a nuclear program using highly enriched uranium. They had agreed in 1994 during the uh, Geneva talks that was the, under the Geneva Framework Agreement, they had agreed to shut down their five megawatt reactor at uh, and they'd also agreed to uh, to stop uh, any kind of nuclear program. But uh, then it was revealed uh, in 2002 that they had uh, a separate program using highly enriched uranium. This revelation came about during a meeting between the U.S.-North uh, Korea negotiator James Kelly and his entourage. They went to Pyongyang, and uh, they spoke to Kim sok Ju, who was, I think, then the foreign minister. He now has a higher position. They showed him documents and, and diagrams and maps and said, we know you have this highly enriched uranium. And he said to have admitted, uh, oh, you know a lot or something like that, you know. Afterwards, North Korea said it never admitted any such thing, that they never said they had HEU. Now, of course, they say they do have HEU. It's been well known uh, uh, that North Korea now is well known to have highly enriched uranium. Uh, and it's been well known to have been getting advice and assistance from Iran in this program. North Korea, in turn, has shipped uh, missiles, Nodong uh, missiles and other missiles, and Scud missiles to Iran. There's a tremendous relationship between North Korea and Iran on nukes and missiles. So uh, after the revelation that North Korea had this highly enriched uranium in uh, 2002, the Geneva framework completely broke down. And uh, by 2003, there were no more shipments of heavy oil from the U.S. to North Korea, which the U.S. had been shipping every, every year. And, uh, and there were no more inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, looking at the North Korean reactor. So the whole thing, the whole program was shot. It went down the tubes, so to speak, uh, in 2002. And Sunshine, by that time, was really revealed to have been a failure. If the summit was the ultimate expression, uh, to quote you, of Kim's desire for the Nobel Prize, and if the Sunshine policy overall was, well, not quite as successful as it should or could have been, do you believe that had there been another man, had Kim Dae-jung not been so interested in getting a Nobel Prize, would there have been such a summit between North and South Korea? There probably wouldn't have been a summit. Uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung won election as president. Uh, due to an interesting uh, set of circumstances. The conservative Lee Wei Chang waged a strong campaign, but another conservative, the governor of, Kyung, of Gyeonggi province around Seoul, waged a third-party campaign. He was a conservative also. And that took away votes from Lee Wei Chang, so therefore DJ, to everybody's shock and amazement, won the election by a, a rather narrow margin. Had Lee Wei Chang been elected president, I'd think there's very little, if any, possibility that there would have been a summit. I think there might have been a more realistic policy toward North Korea. I should point out uh, that the Sunshine Policy broke down in, totally in 2002 when DJ was still president. North Korea did that, even though Kim Dae-jung was president. While his successor, No Mu Yun, was president, they conducted a nuclear test in 2006. Sunshine Policy broke down in 2002. They didn't conduct a nuclear test then, but the policy broke down. In 2006, while Nomu Yun was president, they did their first nuclear test. Interestingly enough, Nomu Yun also went to North Korea for, for a summit just before the uh, 2007 election. He was not running again. By the way, if you're wondering why uh, DJ only served five years and Nomu Yun only served five years, under the Korean Constitution of 1987, you can only serve one five-year term. You're limited to a single five-year term. The title of your latest book in English is Korea Betrayed. Was Kim Dae-jong a leader who was self-interested, let's say, if not morally corrupt from the beginning, and who only used policies such as the Sunshine Policy as a way to achieve his goal, in this case the Nobel Prize, or was it rather someone who had fought for most of his life and actually just was a disappointment at the most important moments? Well, I would say that I wouldn't condemn DJ quite as harshly, but I would say he was definitely a political opportunist and a very brilliant man politically. Uh, 
very skillful at organizing followers and, and maintaining a following. He, uh, he was said to be uh, very uh, sort of almost dictatorial in terms of how he treated his cabinet members. During his five-year presidency, he kept on rotating people in and out of cabinet positions. I believe he had about 150 ministers for about, let's say, the most 20 positions. Uh, n no minister lasted for more than a year or two. Uh, he would give the job to somebody else, you know, just for political reasons, for reasons of his own relationships and, you know, whatever was going on there. Uh, so he, he, was, he was very much a political opportunist, a political animal. You know, I wouldn't uh, condemn him as, I wouldn't really say he was a bad man, uh, but I do think he was a political opportunist of the first order. And I think he fooled a lot of people, especially American intellectuals and academics, into thinking he was a lot greater than he was. Donald Kirk, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.